Welcome to the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom. The book we will feature today is a thriller that dares you to put it down. Overwatch by Matthew Betley is a novel with incredible action, passion, and friendship in an era where terrorism seems part of everyday life. Welcome to our show, Matthew Betley. Thanks, Lois. It's my pleasure to be here. You, as one reviewer wrote, your book, Overwatch, has so much action, you scarcely believe that the entire story takes place over a scant three days in October of 2008. It begins when retired Marine Captain Logan West wakes up from the depths of an alcoholic blackout, and he's very surprised to find an assassin waiting for him in the basement of his Annapolis, Maryland home. But rather than wanting to kill him, the assassin wants information that he believes that only Logan West has. Then the action takes us to the isolated wilderness of Helena, Montana, to a drug cartel's fortress in Mexico, to the Haditha Dam in Iraq, and it's a win-at-all-cost mission to stop a revenge-seeking madman from drawing the United States into what could turn out to be another world war. Overwatch is a terrific, fast-paced debut novel. Our guest author, Matt Betley, spent 10 years as a U.S. Marine officer and was trained as a scout sniper, platoon commander, infantry officer, and general intelligence officer. And so, Matthew, what inspired you to become a writer, especially in the thriller genre? Well, uh, so these are the kinds of books that I grew up reading. Tom Clancy, Robert Ludlum. Uh, there was an author named Eric Van Lusbader that I used to read. And in 2009, um, you know, like my protagonist, uh, it's also important to note that I'm a recovering alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And when I was sober for about six months in 2009, my wife and I were on vacation and I was reading this bestseller that had been referred by Stephen King in an Entertainment Weekly mm -hmm. um, issue. And I was bored out of my mind. And I was on vacation, and I l literally just turned to my wife and said, I can't believe this is a bestseller. I could write a better book than this. I obsessed about it for more than a year. And what year was this that you were on the vacation? It was 2009. Okay. And so in, about a year later, uh, my daughter uh, was three months old. Mm -hmm. And after obsessing about it, I finally just sat down, and I told my wife, okay, here's my five-year plan. She looked at me and said, <laughs> Hun, that's great. However, you're not quitting your day job. <laughs> that's right. That's right. How did you start off writing? Did you have an outline? Did you um, really think about all your experiences in Iraq? How did, how did you begin? So for me, uh, it, it was first, the, the most important thing was that I wanted to write something, like I said, that I would want to read, mm -hmm. but I wanted to write the biggest, fastest, action-packed roller coaster ride that I could create. It is. And, but I also wanted to be... Uh, I wanted it to have some very serious authenticity. So uh, uh, what I did was I decided to write what I knew. Uh, you know, when I was a junior officer, I had all this tactical training. Mm -hmm. Then once you get promoted, you start holding staff positions. I had been to Fallujah before the surge. I had been in Africa after 9-11. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I, I, I wanted to create a story that had real places, real units, real weapons, but a completely fictitious plot. Okay. And, and, and I just wanted that to be something that would grip the reader from page one and not let go until it was over. It does, it does. Now, I, um, I know that Simon and Schuster are very involved with this book, but, but it's also an Emily Bessler book. What is an Emily Bessler book? So the way it works is Simon & Schuster is like the umbrella corporation, mm -hmm. and then there are divisions, and Atria is one of the divisions, and mm -hmm. then Emily Bessler Books is, headed by Emily Bessler herself, is the imprint in, in Atria. And Emily Bessler Books is probably the best premier house that I could have landed at for the thriller genre. It's created greats like Vince Flynn, mm -hmm. Brad Thor. Great. It has the fiction of, I think, Glenn Beck, mm -hmm. Jody Picoult, John Connolly. I mean, the list could go on. Mm -hmm. but they're all extremely successful authors, and I, I, I'm somewhat humbled and uh, intimidated to be amongst their company, especially as a debut author. Exactly. Well, then how did you find an agent, or, and how, did, how long did it take you? I mean, when you, after you finished your first draft, or, or, or edited it maybe to the second draft, what, then what happened? Well, as uh, scary as taking incoming rocket or mortar fire can be, I will honestly <laughs> say that getting the book published is, a, is almost as stressful. Not quite, but almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was a roller coaster ride, literally, where I wrote the first draft over, over a period of 18 months and eight days. Mm -hmm. I received constructive criticism from another best selling author named Chris Reich that somebody put me in touch with. Okay. Um, and his, his feedback, I'll remember it to this day, he also actually interviewed me for a, an online article. And uh, now, 
but it was, you got a lot of talent, but you got to be disciplined about the way you write. I was like, okay, take that on. You got to have thick skin. Um, but after 18 months, eight days of writing it, six months of editing, then I started to look for an agent. Yes. At the time, there, every year there's a guy named Jeff Herman who puts out this book called Jeff Herman's Guide to uh, Publishers, Agents, and Editors. Sure. I used the 2012 edition. There were 92 commercial fiction agencies. Each one has separate requirements. And Some want... And yeah. they're located all over the country. All over the country. country yeah. Some want you to submit uh, five pages. Mm -hmm. Some want ten pages. Mm -hmm. They want you to do it online. They want you to send it in hard copy. Uh, so I, that took another six months. And then it was, okay, get ready for the rejections. No, 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 no. I was like, oh, my goodness, is this ever going to end? And then <laughs> finally it was number 83 that said, we love this. We want this. They signed me. And then... Um, then uh, it was another 14 months before we actually had a deal with Simon and & Schuster. And, and the deal was actually done in June of 2014, yet the book just came out this past Tuesday. Ooh. So it's been 21 months since I had the initial deal. So it's really exciting, really exciting. Now, you are also doing all kinds of media interviews, aren't you? I mean, you're going around the country promoting this book. I am. It's, it's actually been a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, I started this week by being interviewed on uh, AM radio station 1430 in Annapolis. Sure. I was on the Channel 9 CBS morning show, Great Day Washington. I, I think it was Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I had a, a Baltimore ABC news crew at my house Thursday morning. <laughs> that's for a story that's going to run later this week. I'm flying out of town tomorrow to the Midwest. I come back, then I'm going to Arizona, and then I'm going to be in Rhode Island. And it, yeah, and, yeah. And it's yeah. Just, you mean you're like a? It's like you're a best-selling author, but this is your first book. It it is. It's it, and, it is. And so it's it. Well, I have to say that this is just fabulous that you're here. And um, now I love the the great dis descriptive language you use during all these fight scenes in this book. I mean, it, this book is so action-packed. I mean. Uh, what job does your book's protagonist, Logan West, have? Is Logan West you in the Marines? I mean, he's he's such a dynamic. Um, well, so what what I would say is L Logan West is uh, you know as we find Logan West, he's a very troubled guy. Yes, um, he is. He's he has received an inheritance from when his uh, parents died, mm -hmm. so he's not working when we find him. Mm -hmm. He's just wallowing in self pity uh, because of the events that occurred to him in two thousand and four in Fallujah. Uh, and I tell that origin story over three parts throughout the book as well, which explains why he is the way we, why he is when we find and him. And he's drinking too much. He's dr oh yeah, he's he's a blackout drunk. Mm -hmm. Now as a, as a uh, recovering alcoholic, I, I've been there, done that. So I, I, you know, it was very easy to write because oh my, that's how I felt when I'd wake up. So. <laughs> it was amazing. And then let me ask you about the title of your book, The Overwatch. What does that mean? So Overwatch is when you have a military unit that's providing cover for a, a, a friendly unit that's moving on the ground in front of you, um, you know, either sub with, you know, sniper support or mm -hmm. indirect fire or some kind of, mm -hmm. of military support. So it's, it's, it's an overview of what's really happening. Now, now, what I would say is that it's also a metaphor for what Logan's being asked to do, which is kind of be in overwatch of the whole country as a result of this threat. Yes, yes. And um, now, how much of your novel, Overwatch, stems from your personal experience as in the Marine Corps, you think? Well, uh, what I would say is that the places are real, the units are real, the time frame is real as well. Uh, I was in Camp Fallujah before the surge. Uh, in those years, when you were there were 2007? 2006 to 2007. 2007. Okay. I actually got out of country the week before the surge started. Well, how did you feel about Iraq when you arrived there? It was, it was actually very interesting because I had all this tactical training, mm -hmm. and, and for that brief period I was privileged to command a scout sniper unit. Uh, you know, I used to shoot a lot as a, a second lieutenant, and, you know, I had been through a, a pistol and rifle coaches course and a bunch of other marksmanship mm -hmm. tactical training. And so when I got to Iraq in 06, and by then I was a captain, and I was in there, I was uh, deployed as what's called an assistant operations officer, kind mm -hmm. of a planner. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was looking to say, okay, I'm real excited to get here. Well, as soon as we got there in 06, it was as bad as it was in El Ambar province at any time. Um, the camp started taking incoming on a regular basis, you know, a couple times a week. You were, uh, and you were losing colleagues, right? You were losing. So I lost friends in other parts of Iraq. Uh, however, Marines on, on Camp Fallujah were killed as, when they'd go out in the wire conducting operations. Mm. There was a female uh, Marine major that I knew I wasn't close to, but I had seen her and talked to her mm. on several occasions named Megan McClung, who was this 
unbelievably impressive young woman who was killed in Ramadi when I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's war. And if you left the wire, and le as in left Camp Fallujah, you know, it was just all bets were off. Ooh, and, and, and even then, by, the, in, by October, because I got there in July mm -hmm. or, or August, by October, um, even just being on Camp Fallujah itself. It was you know, dangerous, it, very yeah. dangerous, yeah. Yep. Ooh. Well, I read that uh, American Sniper helps to make Iraq war stories hot again. I mean, do you agree? Do you think that that is a... I think so. I, I, you know, it, it was a fantastic movie. I, you know, we have a very patriotic country that supports our troops. Great. And, and he did a fantastic job with bringing that story, you know, Clint mm -hmm. Eastwood did, with bringing Chris Kyle's story to film. Your book covers a lot of places around the globe. I mean, I'd like for you to tell our viewers where the action takes place in your book because you, you take it, you know, to Montana, to Mexico, to... So, <laughs> so why, why these places? So for me, I, I wanted to start the action in a very intimate way, which is why we have the scene with Logan's uh, estranged wife, Sarah, in, in rural Maryland. So I, I started it in Logan's basement, then it goes to you know Sarah's house, or which was their ho the home that they lived in together before mm. he moved out because mm. of his drinking. Then I went to uh, where we find Gunnery Sergeant John Quick, who's living in seclusion and retirement in Helena, Montana, on a, in a house he built on a lake. And from there, the the settings kind of build in scope and scale, as well as the action sequences. It does well. and, and, and you know from there we fun we we go to the Alamo in San Antonio. Uh, this, the, a drug cartel, a fictitious drug cartel that I created uh, in north of Mexico. But you and, know, but your, your descriptive language, you feel like you're right there. You, you, are, you, you cover it. I mean, you absolutely see the buildings. <laughs> well, it, it, so what's amazing is some of these places I've been to and the, the ones that I haven't been to, you can find a lot on online. The, right? online. <laughs> there are actually <laughs> videos post, uh, posted on YouTube that people took inside some of the buildings at the Alamo where you're not supposed to take video. Oh, wow. And, and so it's amazing the walkthroughs you can get just by watching somebody's tourist or vacation video. Yeah. Well, Matt, Matt where did you grow up and where did you attend college? So I was born in New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I'm a Yankees fan. Mm -hmm. And then my family moved when I was six and a half to Cincinnati, okay. which is why I'm a diehard Cincinnati Bengals fan. But that's a whole sad <laughs> subject. And then uh, mm -hmm. I, I actually went to, so I grew up in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a Jesuit high school there called St. Xavier. And then I went to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Okay. Very good school. Now, of course, alcoholism and PTSD are issues that your characters deal with in Overwatch. I mean, are they from your experience as well? The alcoholism is absolutely, you know, I went with the old adage, write what you know. However, I didn't suffer PTSD the way that Logan does. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I will say that when I got back from Iraq, and a lot of guys that I know who got back from Iraq, kind of jumpy for the first, like, three, six months or so. But I didn't have flashbacks or anything That's like that, e even when we were taking incoming fire. Ooh. Well, you know, one reviewer wrote your novel is a great blend of creative fictional story and a present-day geopolitical post-Iraq context. I mean, have you been to Iraq since you left? I have not. I, I left the country in 07. The drawdown began in 08. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have not been back. Okay. And now, what have you learned about writing that you didn't know before? Well, that, that's a great question because I didn't know anything before about writing. <laughs> uh, in because fact, you, you did not major that in college. I have no creative writing degree. I have no English literature degree. I have no formal training whatsoever. I literally sat down and just started typing away. And for me, my creative process, uh, I'm a very visual guy. Mm -hmm. So well, I sit down to my computer, I'll put on a, uh, my headset, and I will play musical scores composed by some of the great movie composers mm -hmm. like Hans Zimmer, uh, John Williams, mm -hmm. uh, people like that, and then I just start typing. And what I, I actually do is I kind of go into the zone and I see the action playing out in my mind and I hear the dialogue and feel it and I feel like I'm just transcribing. Wow. I don't outline beforehand, I don't have a lot of notes. <laughs> Um, I just, I just go. I know where I want to go, and I go. You know, you know, and you know what the story, what story mm -hmm. you want to tell. That's yeah. right. Well, what kind of? Um, I mean, I was just like, there's so much uh, equipment in this book, but you know, with, with different weapons. I mean, what kind of knife proved that Logan West attacker was a professional killer? I mean, what was the scoop behind this knife that you know that that? that so, 
But so, so there's a lot of special forces uh, or, or special ops knives out there. You especially if you if you have what's called like a tanto blade that has like a, mm -hmm. a defined edge on the or an angled edge on mm -hmm. the back. Mm -hmm. um, I just did a lot of research and looked and thought, hey, that looks cool. Why don't you know? Maybe he'll have that. But I also have deployed around guys who carry different kinds of knives as well. Okay, so you know, you know a lot of knives then, right? <laughs> well, you, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, when I was at the infantry officer school, I think we did a bunch of combat knife training, you know, mm -hmm. and this is, a, again, in a much younger life. Um, but, yeah, I, I've carried knives before. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I read that the FBI hostage rescue team cited in Chapter 4 was called the most elite unit in the world. I mean, is this true that there's a unit that's more, that's better than the Navy SEALs and the Green Berets and the Delta team? Well, so what I would say is that the FBI's HRT and the research that I did, um, and, and what's kind of funny, and, and this is a true story, when I got back in 07, um, so the FBI's HRT team is comprised of a lot of former uh, trigger pullers from the Military, special ops yeah, communities, guys. from Delta, SEALs, okay. uh, Army Rangers. When I got back uh, in 07, I applied to the FBI Academy. I passed the exam back when it had the, the uh, math component, and I talked to the HRT guys and they, the, because they saw that I, I commanded a scout sniper platoon as a junior officer. But what's funny is that when they found out that I wasn't actually one of the enlisted trigger pullers, they were like, yep, sorry, we're not interested. We're, we're looking for, a, a, and I'll never forget it on the phone, being like, okay, well, that's good. They're like, hey, we still want you as, as, as a special agent, but not for HRT. It was like, oh. mm, Too bad, right? <laughs> that's, that's okay. I mean, obviously, it's all worked out. It's all worked out. That's right. Well, why did you choose fiction rather than nonfiction for sharing your Marine Corps experiences? I mean, you probably could have done it in, as, a, as nonfiction, right? Well, I, I wanted to write something that I enjoy, and I really just wanted to entertain the reader, and okay. that, to me, is the most important thing about all of this. Mm -hmm. It's not about me. It's not about my experiences. It's about what the reader sees in his or her head and feels as they're reading the book. I literally wanted to put the reader in the action, well, that's and, and that's why I went with fiction. Very smart. And uh, what did your former colleagues in the Marines say about your novel's revelations? Did they, did they read it? And oh, I've had a lot of, so I am friends with a bunch of current uh, Marines, and everyone who's read it, it has enjoyed it. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. No, I'm sure they love it. And, uh, and of course, the, the positive online reviews uh, of Overwatch, it's five stars. It's, it's amazing. It's really great. Now, are any of the characters in, that book, in your book based on real-life counterparts? Uh, well, it, it's kind of funny because people who know me are like, oh, you're Logan. And then other people say, oh, you're John Quick. And what I would say is, uh, my, at least my mentality is a combination of the two of them, which is why they're easy characters to write. <laughs> but on a day-to-day -day uh, basis, I'm more of the sarcastic John Quick okay. type than okay. I am the very serious, brooding Logan West. Okay. Now, um, well, what are some takeaways you would like our readers to, to, to leave with after reading your book? Well, most importantly, I want the reader to enjoy it. I, I also, uh, it's also important that the reader realize that I've created kind of an alternate reality to what we currently have. I, I created, uh, tried to create authentic and realistic leaders who would make those hard decisions that I think uh, a lot of our leaders fail to make today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, again, it's, it's intended to take the reader outside reality. It's intended a, as an escape. Yes, and it is a great escape and great, great read. Well, how hard was it for you to come back into civilian life after being in the war zone? I mean, did I, you? I actually had a, a seamless transition. Uh, um, I, I got out of the Marine Corps in 2009, and I just took a civilian job with the federal government. Okay. I read you spent your first semester of your senior year in college investigating felony murder cases as an intern investigator in Washington, D.C. for the Public Defender's Office. I did. And that must have been an interesting experience. As a 21-year-old cocky college senior coming from the Midwest, it was an amazing experience. It was actually a formative experience of my life, and I've talked about it greatly for anyone who will listen. Um, my job was to literally hunt down uh, felon or witnesses to felony murder cases. Uh, I clerked for a couple, or I worked for a couple of attorneys, one who had clerked for Thurgood Marshall. Ooh. I was privileged to meet Reuben Hurricane Carter and spend two hours with him in a conference room before I even knew who he was. <laughs> um, I, another know, book, right? <laughs> well, so what's funny is myself and another investigator were checking into the office, and he was sitting in this conference room, and we walked in there like, hey, do you need any help? He said, oh, no, I'm just waiting for an attorney. Turns out the attorney he was waiting for was the one who had actually 
uh, secured his release from prison. So he pulls out this book, says, hey, I'm this guy. They're, they're supposed to be making a movie about me. He signs it for me. Five years later in Cincinnati, I'm in a theater, and I see a preview for a Hurricane with Denzel. And I'm like, I know that guy. Yeah, I was there. And, and, and I went home and got the book. I was like, look. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, so it was an unbelievable but, experience. But really cool, really cool. Your character, Juan Black, is feeling helpless because he knows the federal government can easily track people. I mean, is that wildly, wildly known? That can the federal government really easily track people? So there's a lot of research online, and I'll just leave it at that. You know, everything that I used regarding how the government locates people with cell phones and things like that is stuff that I was able to find online. Okay. But the horrors that many military men and women go through affect their marriage when they return from service. I mean, had, has that been your observation? Uh, well, so for me personally, uh, um, what I would say is that I'm sure my wife would probably say, yes, you were jumpy. Yes, you know, you, you uh, sh have a short temper. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I would say it probably does. I would say anytime somebody deploys to that kind of stressful environment, and it really was a pressure cooker when we were there, um, that, yeah, it, it, it can have a long-term effect. It, it can affect relationships. Sure, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because, I mean, the hero in your book has a broken marriage. So he it, does. Yeah, yeah, so. And it was interesting to read that the CIA agents have ridiculous cover names, even when it's unnecessary. Uh, was that your experience also in Iraq? I, I, I will say that I have come across a few of those. And, and <laughs> I, but, but, yes, it's kinda, it, it is kind of a, 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 a known fact. So, huh. and, and, and it's always something ubiquitous, like Jim, John, Bob, okay, got it. Very simple names, yes, yeah. yeah. And I was very impressed with the two helicopters in Chapter 36. I and mean, Can you tell our viewers how these helicopters were equipped? I mean, they have so much on them. Well, I, I, so I, I believe those were the, uh, the French helicopters yes, yes. that the Mexicans, uh, the Mexican Special Forces were, were using in the cartel compound. I just did a lot of research on them. Now, the helicopters I've flown around in are like CH-53s that the Marine Corps flies in, but I wanted to find good military helicopters that had a lot of weapons on them, especially for that sequence. <laughs> and, they, and you keep reading about all the weapons on this helicopter, and you think, my gosh. <laughs> oh, yes. It's amazing. Uh, but they fit, how, on, they fit on to a helicopter, yep. yeah. And then uh, in Chapter 39, uh, the original plan was for Juan Black to travel through Mexico and arrive in Venezuela and then travel to Maricaibo, Venezuela, uh, where he would get a, a bank account and a fake name. Uh, you know, Maricaibo is, I've been to Maricaibo, Venezuela, and I think it's fantastic, interesting city. Um, how did you find out about Maricaibo? I, I just researched it. I, I, I looked online for a, an interesting city and, so, and thought, how can I uh, create some place where uh, I, I think I'm going to be bringing some action from another book to? And that was what I came up with. Huh. I've never been there, so uh, you're, uh, okay. you, you got me beat uh, okay. on that one. <laughs> well, you got to go. You gotta uh. go. And, um, now, what are your plans for the future of Logan West? Uh, which one reviewer described as a very likable badass character. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to put it. Uh, uh, He's very likable. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted him to be, I wanted all the characters to be relatable, first and yes. foremost. But, uh, and they are. So this, this is an origin story. And uh, my intent, and I, and I already have all the first five books of the series planned in my head. Book two called First Shot is completely ready to go. It's in copy editing right now mm. from March of 2017. It's a continuation. I introduce a couple of new characters, but it kind of build it. Well, it completely builds on this, especially the way this ends. Yes. Uh, and it doesn't end in a cliffhanger, but it obviously leaves it open for book two mm -hmm. uh, for the overall mythology of at least the first five books. So my goal was to make each one a self-contained story, but part of a, of a larger picture. Well, I just thought, you know, there's so many magnificent chapters. I mean. Um, Chapter 42 is magnificent. I mean, there was great dialogue uh, and, and, of course, the unfolding of the plot. I mean, can, can you give us a simple synopsis or do you want to keep it secret? Uh, <laughs> of, of this book? Yeah. Uh, so what it is is, uh, you know, Lo Logan West wakes up from a blackout to have to kill a mercenary in his house in Annapolis. They're looking for a flag that he and his Force Recon Platoon acquired in Iraq um, in 2004. And as a result of Logan's impulsive actions, it triggers a race for this artifact that goes across North America, Mexico, and Iraq. And, and like I mentioned earlier, I also tell the uh, a flashback sequence told in three parts of that ambush on that uh, on Logan's Force Recon platoon at that insurgent compound from 2004. Right, right, which makes it so so 
dynamic. And then um, it was also interesting reading your novel that there were ID cards provided to Iraqi contractors for access to, for access into the U.S. Marine camps. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, did, did this result in many battles because the IDs were in the hands of Iraqi insurgents? That I don't know, but I do know I, I use that uh, bit of reality because anyone who was a contractor working on Camp Fallujah had an ID badge. You know, whether or not you were part of the security or the guys working in the barber shop or doing laundry, it just didn't matter. Everybody had an ID. Mm -hmm. And I made that, that piece up about, <laughs> about the ID cards. So. Oh, you did? Okay. I mean, about uh, I, I, what was the, the question? Well, the question is, I mean, did, did this result in people... Uh, getting false IDs. It probably happened. I, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Or at least guys got IDs, altered them, and were able to come into the camps. So, yeah. I can't think of any concrete examples. but So, yeah, so these contractors were kind of a little, little bit dangerous then, right? It just depended on who the contractors were. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Now, are you or, or your agent in discussion with producers in Hollywood for a movie based on this book? Well, I'm very fortunate in that I am represented by creative artists, uh, by uh, a great book-to-film agent named John Kassir, who also happened to be the guy who sold The Martian to Ridley Scott mm. as well as 13 Hours to Michael Bay. So yes, yeah, since the book came out on Tuesday, there is a, a major push. What I will say is that when I started writing this, I wrote this book to be directed by Michael Bay uh, because it, it's just the way that I loved his, his early action films, and I thought he could do a great job with a very authentic, realistic action thriller. And do you have any actors in mind? Uh, you know, at one point, I considered a, an angry Chris Evans. You know, if you ever <laughs> saw Snowpiercer, where it's a kind of a dark character, yeah. not his Captain America, happy-go-lucky kind of persona, but more of a darker Chris Evans. And the title of your next book is, and that's going to be coming, what's the, what, what is the synopsis of that? That's going to be... So First Shot uh, takes place two years, roughly two, two years after, after this, this okay. um, and, and it opens with uh, a, a Russian special ops team uh, conducting an attack in Alaska to acquire uh, U.S. developmental technology. And it triggers a global race from Alaska to Spain to the Mediterranean and then to Sudan. And that book will be ready? In it's, it's, well, it, it's it, like it'll a, be out in March of 2017. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, Matt, where can our viewers find your book in Arlington? Well, if they want to know more about me and the books overall, they can go to MatthewBetley.com. However, the book itself is available everywhere. Barnes & Noble, Costco, Books A Million, all independent bookstores. Uh, there's even an audio book of it. Thank you so much for joining us on the Bookman's Corner today. It's been a wonderful experience being talking to you. Well, thanks, Lois. I appreciate it. And most importantly, I just hope everybody enjoys the book. Uh, they will. They will. And thanks for watching. Please join us again next month for a new edition of the Bookman's Corner. I'm Lois Lindstrom.